This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. My name is Jack Pawazek, and I'm the Associate Vice Chancellor for General Services at UCLA, a small campus just 90 miles south of here. Uh, I was talking to Lisa right before, and she said General Services is a very broad name. It is. It's intentional. <clears throat> but it has facilities management, EH&S, that's environment health and safety. Uh, it has transportation, parking, you know, the usual suspects plus sustainability, emergency management, and police. And I've been at UCLA uh, as a staff employee for almost 35 years, so I've seen him come and go. Uh, but it's, uh, it's a very uh, financially difficult time for the university, and it matches a couple of bad times that we've had in the past, but we'll make it through. But today we're going to talk about student-led office greening and building greening. I attended the last part of the, la of the last session <clears throat> in this room, and it was on developing climate action plans. And in the discussion period, they talked about the lack of student involvement in some, some campuses in terms of the climate action plan. Well, in this session, it's almost the reverse. What we have here is initiatives and programs that are being led by the students. Uh, what I'm going to do, first of all, it's being uh, webcast, so behave. Uh, for those of you that are a little older, it's being taped or filmed, so I have to do, you know, translation here. Just stay with my humor here. <clears throat> it is four o'clock. Um, one other piece of business, you will see this, if you're sitting on it, well, you can, but please uh, fill it out at the end and be generous to the speakers. We have two very good um, presentations, one from UC Santa Barbara, one from UC Berkeley. The one from UC Santa Barbara will go first. They'll introduce the speakers. They'll have about, <clears throat> excuse me, 20 minutes. Uh, we then will have the Berkeley presentation. I'll introduce the three speakers, and then we'll have a question and answer period, probably the last 20, 25 minutes, and then we'll all let you go. Before I start, one more thing. Uh, this is an accredited AIA, um, I guess, seminar worth 9 million units or whatever it is. If you have any questions, please... Uh, speak to the staff in terms of how to get accreditation. All right. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce, uh, Lee, excuse me, uh, Eli Crispy and Courtney Lyman from UC Santa Barbara. Both of them have been working very hard on just uh, making this conference be as successful as it is. And, uh, and three weeks ago, they, were, they found out that they also had to make this presentation. So my compliments to you both. <clears throat> a few words about them. Eli is, uh, just finished his double major degree. It seems like everybody graduates now with double majors. It's no big deal anymore. Not in my day. We were just lucky to graduate. Um, Eli graduated with uh, geolo geology, or geography, excuse me, and environmental studies from in June of 2009. He is uh, an intern in the, in the Interdepartmental Ellison Hall Sustainability Committee. He's been on the a moving force on PACES, P-A-C-E-S, all in capital letters, and you'll hear a lot more about that. Uh, he's the student representative to the Chancellor's Sustainability Committee. Courtney uh, also is a recent uh, graduate uh, from UC Santa Barbara with a degree in political science. She's been a key uh, 
member in the development of the new PACES program and is a very big moving force of sustainability on uh, UC Santa Barbara. All right, why don't you come up here and do your presentation and then we'll go from there. Thank you. in that too. Um, but my name is Courtney Lyman and this is Eli Crispy and we're both interns with the PACES program. Um, so what exactly is PACES? Um, PACES stands for the Program for the Assessment and Certification for the Environment and Sustainability. It's very similar to a green business program in that we audit various UCSB departments and propose recommendations on how they can become more sustainable and we certify the departments to go above and beyond the campus sustainability policies and practices that are currently um, enacted. And um, PACES itself is a student-led effort between the Ellison Hall Sustainability Committee and Associated Students Recycling. Both of these groups um, are established on campus with a lot of experience in sustainability issues, as well as a lot of ties to uh, groups and resources um, on sustainability. PACES is also managed by a full-time campus sustainability coordinator. Um, so the Ellison Hall Sustainability Committee is an interdepartmental inter committee with a broad representation um, among the building occupants. Um, Ellison Hall Sustainability Committee has had a lot of accomplishments over the years, which include a successful energy reduction effort. That includes um, taking out in one of the main labs all the CRT monitors and replacing them with LCD monitors. And um, many of the departments have implemented replacing their power strips with smart power strips. So it's these little things that really make a difference. Um, it's also been a great testing ground for pilot programs. One of our recent recycling pilot programs has become a model for um, the new campus-wide recycling system and it also has helped us achieve the highest diversion rate here on campus. Additionally, um, we've brought a lot of value to academic departments by engaging both undergraduates and graduates within the departments, and we've had a lot of outreach with all of our su success from other departments asking for our help with more sustainable um, measures. And then we have Associated um, Student Recycling. This um, ASR has been running a recycling, um, or has been running their recycling program since the 1980s, and has a very vast wealth of different knowledge and um, kind of resources that we can go to. And they provide training and resources to any willing person or department. They also have a widely recognized annual awards competition, which is successful in building departmental leadership, um, but it is based on limited data collection and it only has the capability to recognize a few departments a year. With PACES, we would like to build upon that success and go into greater analytical depth and basically recognize more departments. As for our funding, um, really our main expense is paying for our interns, but we have funding through the Geography Department who has really recognized the importance of um, the Ellison Hall Sustainability Committee. They have done in-kind donations along with donating um, staff time, which has been a great help to us. ASR has contributed money from their outreach budget, and um, TGIF, which is here on this campus, um, is helping us with their initiative fund. We'll hand over the rest to Thank you. All right, so I. We good? All right. Uh, next, I'd like to talk about what the goals of the PACES program are and what we hope to accomplish. So, UCSB, and I'm sure many of your schools as well, have signed on to numerous policies and practices. We've established multiple sustainability goals, and there are so many of these that it takes even our sustainability coordinators significant time and effort to keep track of them all. So you can imagine that the departments are often completely unaware that these policies and goals exist, and even when they do, they have limited access to the resources that are necessary to comply with them. So PACES seeks to make the departments aware of these policies and to provide some of the resources necessary that, to achieve compliance. And you can see here just a small sample of the policies 
There are the very broad goals like the ACU PCC and the Talores Declaration. There are the system-wide goals set by the UC Office of the President. And then UCSB has itself set multiple sustainability goals with our Campus Sustainability Plan, all, courses, all sorts of uh, other campus policies. It's just a lot for any one academic department to keep track of. We also uh, set the goal of, excuse me, uh, all the necessary resources to meet all these goals exist here on campus, but departments are often unaware that these resources even exist. So another one of our goals is to connect these departments with the resources that will allow them to meet these goals. Uh, for example, the dialogue with custodians on campus is very, very important. Say if a department wants to install a new recycling bin system, they're going to have to work closely with the custodians to make sure that that system meets all the necessary regulations, that it gets emptied on a regular basis, and so on. There are uh, also other resources on campus that will allow departments to get free green cleaning supplies. There are groups that will perform free energy audits for departments. So sometimes really all it takes for us is just to introduce departments with these resources and make the connections between people. Another goal that we seek is to promote behavioral change within the department and to encourage individual and departmental leadership. One of the great things about behavioral change is that it's often immediate. For example, if you, it may be difficult for a department to buy a new LCD monitors for all their staff, but if you can just get those staff to shut down the monitors during lunch breaks and when they go home, you can reduce your electricity consumption immediately. Uh, behavioral change is also quite inexpensive. Again, if you can get little signs printed out that say, remind people to turn off their lights, go around, post them on all the light switches, it's not taking a whole lot of money, it's not taking a whole lot of effort, but it can have a significant savings. We uh, do believe that facilities management does an excellent job at establishing the sustainability infrastructure of a campus. However, it is up to the departments and the occupants to properly use the materials that FM is providing them. It's a great idea to put recycling bins in every single office, but if those bins aren't being properly, uh, properly used and properly emptied, then we haven't really achieved much. Also, we think it's easier for a department to create change through a, a grassroots effort that comes from the staff and the faculty and the students instead of a top-down policy that may come from FM or the administration. We also feel that a sustainable department is one that acknowledges FM cannot do everything because they can't. So a sustainable department is really one that is proactive and takes their own initiative. Our, our program is also designed to prepare buildings to become LEED certified. Uh, UCSB has set a goal, some of you may know, of certifying 25 existing buildings under the LEED EB program by 2012. And LEED certification is, of course, based on a three-month performance and evaluation period. And here at UCSB, this is often the first time that, our that an individual department is exposed to campus sustainability policies. So in developing our metrics, we have taken into account the LEED criteria, and then by going through the PACES evaluation, a department is able to lay the necessary framework for a more successful LEED certification. And even in buildings that are not eligible for the LEED assessment for whatever reason, we feel that PACES helps those departments to go through a similar process. I'm going to turn it back over to Courtney, who's going to discuss the methodology. So here um, is kind of an overview of the PACES process itself. Um, we assess the departments through audits and then audits, interviews, and surveys. We then analyze these findings and come up with um, different plans to present and recommendations to give to the department at the end of the process. So one of the most, one of the really important um, kind of things we do for data collection would be the occupant survey. Uh, we send out a survey to all the department occupants through email, and it's promoted by the departmental administration to ensure a higher kind of response rate. This survey is meant to gather information about the individual's behavior, knowledge, and attitudes towards sustainability. And these are the categories that are addressed in the survey. We are trying to incorporate as many different components of sustainability as possible. Um, and one of the more important um, pieces of information we can gather from this survey is um, the attitudes of the occupants towards sustainable practices. It helps us see how effective behavioral change can be in, that the, in the department. For example, in one of the departments, 30% of respondents said that they would like to participate in and support a composting project. 
And so this tells us that such a program would be likely to succeed, and it also helps determine how much acceptance or possible resistance we might come across when implementing different policies or programs. Um, next, we like to look at the behavior of the occupants of the department. Um, questions would include how individuals commute to work uh, or campus, whether they use their screen savers or turn off their computers when they leave for lunch, and how they use their blue recycling bins within their office. <laughs> Um, it help, helps us determine the current actions that they're taking to be more sustainable, as well as the effectiveness of any current policies that the department might be implementing. Um, areas not being addressed are, indicate room for any kind of improvement and where incentives might be very helpful. Um, next, we have our business office or, um, interview, which basically focuses on the department's sustainability policies and program, and less on the individual. Um, this gives data on issues such as purchasing, which is pretty much uh, conducted at a departmental level. We also compare the data with the individual responses um, and that have been compiled and kind of get a feel for the effectiveness of the programs that have been implemented so far. Next, we do an energy audit and walkthrough. Um, a team of interns enters every room within the department, and they're usually accompanied by a building um, administrator. This helps interns ensure access to all rooms. They introduce the occupants to us, and um, we also get some, an idea of how each room is used from the administrators. Um, but so the method methodology for the walkthrough itself, um, the interns walk through and count the number, type, and model of all the electrical devices. We look at the computers and the peripheral, peripherals, such as the printers, um, the monitor speakers. We look at the lights, both task lighting and permanent fixtures. And um, we also look at any additional equipment like refrigerators, microwaves, a lot of coffee makers we see. Um, and then we note whether equipment is being centralized or if they're in individual rooms. It's also important to go through and take note of the natu whether natural lighting is being taken advantage of, the prevalence of the recycling bins within the rooms, and the presence of any green cleaning materials. Um, and we do have a, a lot of information through the Ellison Hall Sustainability Com uh, Committee on uh, normal or regularly used electrical appliances, but interns do go through and take additional readings on any uncommon appliances that we might come across. And um, finally, we do a waste audit. Um, a waste audit is performed for each of the departments that participates in PACES, and it provides important information about what the building is throwing out and how it's being disposed of. Waste audits are pretty intensive day-long activities, and they're made possible by our volunteer base and also by our support groups throughout campus. Um, we do have a standardized waste audit procedure that has been adopted campus-wide. In coordination with custodial staff, all the department's waste is collected over either a two-day or week-long period. And um, at the end of the collection period, interns and volunteers sort the waste by bin origin and material type, and then the data is entered electronically and analyzed. And we break down our waste stream by multiple categories, which are all indicated here. And it's important not to see only how much of each material is being thrown out, but whether it's being placed within the right bin. So um, if there's a recyclable that's being placed in the proper bin, the wrong recycling bin, or in the trash, which is never good. Um, and then the overarching goal of our waste audit is to determine whether departments' um, potential diversion rate compared to their to their actual diversion rate. The potential diversion rate indicates how much of the building's materials are, are actually recyclable, whereas the actual diversion rate shows how much of the building's materials are currently being recycled properly. Um, and given these two numbers, we can determine whether it's more of an education problem where we need to inform the occupants how to use their recycling program, or if the recycling program itself needs to be changed considerably. We then put together all of um, our results from the various methods and um, look at the multiple data sets. And we look for examples of departmental and individual leadership, as well as areas for potential improvement. And this gives us a fairly detailed view of how, of how sustainability is working within the department. 
And at the end of our program, um, all department occupants are invited to a presentation where interns present the findings of their analysis and propose and discuss any solutions to those problems or our findings. And we also solicit feedback on the PACES program um, from the occupants to know where we can work on kind of providing better education and getting involved with them. And this presentation provides a summary of the data and focuses on more simple and effective solutions. Afterwards, a more comprehensive climate action and sustainability plan is presented, and this includes more detailed data analysis and analysis, and extensive and long-term recommendations, along with all the references to the resources that they can reach out to to help them further in their sustainability efforts. So uh, lastly, we'd like to discuss what the uh, pilot program that PACES went through was like and where we'd hope to go in the future. Uh, we developed our methodology this past winter, and then in the spring, we conducted our pilot program with three unique departments here on campus, uh, the Transportation and Parking Services, Geography, and the College of Creative Studies. Uh, the first one was Transportation and Parking Services, TPS. They do not have a permanent building. They're located in temporary buildings. So therefore, they're not going to go through the lead assessment process. They differ from a lot of other departments on campus in that they are a non-academic department. They're only staff, no faculty or students. There's also some difficulty for us when we're doing our assessment because many of the staff members work in the field, driving around campus, ensuring compliance with parking regulations, so they don't have permanent offices. And as a result, we have to focus most of our assessment and our recommendations on the stationary administrative staff who are in the building all the time and are able to make the changes. The Department of Geography is a more typical academic department. They have a large population of faculty, staff, and graduate students. The department has many facilities that are used for energy intensive research and teaching purposes. They do a lot of complex modeling and imagery analysis in the department, for example. Uh, most of the geography department is located within Ellison Hall, which makes them not only a member of the Ellison Hall Sustainability Committee, but Ellison Hall is also expected to undergo the LEED EB assessment within the next five years. Because of their participation in the Ellison Hall Sustainability Committee, uh, sustainability is already an integral part of the department's operations, and geography really is already a campus leader in this field, but our assessment indicates that substantial room for improvement exists even within one of the most sustainable departments here on campus. And the last uh, department we went through our, with our pilot program is the College of Creative Studies. They are a specialized academic program here on campus comprised of about 350 undergraduates, a number of faculty who represent different academic disciplines, and then a small group of support staff. The college does not have any graduate students, but they have undergrads who use the building as if they were graduate students. They're in the building 24, 15 to 20 hours a week. They're in there at all hours of the night, and they, they have open access to the building's multiple facilities, art studios, print shops, computer labs, et cetera. Uh, CCS has already taken some of the steps towards sustainability, but they really lack access to a lot of the campus resources that are necessary to achieve sufficient, uh, sufficient change. And the CCS building, like TPS, it's a temporary building, and as of this moment, it will not be going through the lead EB assessment process. So although all three departments are very different and they do require unique solutions to a lot of their problems, we did find that there were some issues that were common to all three of them. Uh, the first issue was on recycling. A lot of building occupants were unsure of what bins certain recyclables should go in, and even when they did know, they may not know where these bins were even located. Uh, for example, we found in all departments there was significant confusion about office pack and what goes in it, whether it's only white paper, whether it can include envelopes with windows or notebooks, whether the staples need to be removed from the paper, etc. Another problem we found was on the area of supermedia. This is another common source of confusion. A lot of occupants weren't aware that you have to separate supermedia from office pack to ensure a cleaner waste stream. They thought it just all went in the same bin. The second issue we found is really the disconnect between the beliefs of the individuals and the, their actions. We found that nearly all building occupants believe it is important to address sustainability within the workplace, but only about a quarter of the respondents say they were actively able to contribute to their sustainability efforts. Now, we don't feel this necessarily so much because they're being lazy about it, but we just don't think they are unaware of how to really get involved. Just to show you this information graphically, all three departments, despite their unique nature, the beliefs are very similar across the board. So we feel that by carrying out our recommendations and when departments implement these policies, 
it will give the staff and the faculty an outlet to get involved in sustainability that not only has environmental impact, but it makes them feel better, makes them feel like they're actually doing something and getting things accomplished. Uh, the third common finding was in the area of purchasing. Uh, UCSB Central Stores provides a very comprehensive catalog of green alternatives to conventional office supplies, but departments were either unaware of this catalog or they were reluctant to use it for various reasons. For example, one department we found, they believe recycled content paper to be more expensive than virgin paper, when in fact here at UCSB, even the 100% post-consumer recycled paper is cheaper than the virgin paper. So it's just a matter of educating them and making them aware that these resources are out there. We also found that none of the departments had a policy requiring new electronic purchases to be Energy Star certified whenever possible. There's something very easy to do. A lot of electronics are now Energy Star certified, but no one had really solidified that and made it a policy. Also, uh, in addition to the environmental, to the reduced environmental impact of all these recommendations, uh, participating in PACES can lead to fi uh, significant financial savings, which is especially important in this current economic climate. To give just one example, the university here gives a 50% discount to individuals who carpool regularly to campus. So if a department can set up a carpooling program within, among their faculty and staff, they're able to save those people a lot of money, and that is really important at this time. So while the environmental results certainly should not be ignored, we have demonstrated through the PACES program that there is a significant economic incentive to becoming more sustainable. It's something that we're all really aware of, but now we have the numbers to, and the research to actually back it up. So then has our pilot program actually been effective? So just, let's just go over the four goals that we have here. The first one, to raise awareness about campus sustainability policy. For example, and we believe that we have succeeded about this one. We have educated all the departments who have gone through our assessment program about all, as many different policies that are out there as we are able. For example, the UCOP requires that all virgin paper be phased out, but many departments were unaware of this policy. They were continuing to buy it, even at the higher price, and we made them aware of this. We succeeded on the second goal, which was to provide resources about campus sustainability. One of the departments that went through our pilot program wanted to set up a more comprehensive recycling system. They didn't know how to get the infrastructure set up. So after they went through our assessment and we were able to obtain the numbers that really backed up this program that they wanted to put in, we were able to put them in touch with the people on campus who could give them the assistance with the infrastructure. The third goal, to create behavioral change, that's a little more uncertain, we don't know yet. We've certainly been able to educate departments about behavioral change and what the individual can do to achieve uh, reduced environmental impact, but we haven't yet gone through to conduct any kind of follow-up assessment to actually see what has happened in these departments so far. The fourth goal, it's also impossible to say because none of the departments that we piloted have gone through the lead assessment yet. Nevertheless, we think we have succeeded in this area because the departments are now aware of the lead process, they know when it's going to happen, and we think that by going through our program, they have laid the necessary foundation for lead evaluation. So going forward with the program, we intend to revise our process based on the feedback that we got from the pilots. We are going to develop a method of actually certifying departments who have undergone a PACES assessment and implemented our recommendations, you know, give them a ranking that they can use to highlight their roles as campus sustainability leaders. We then intend to be approved by the Chancellor's Campus Sustainability Committee, which will allow us to recruit more departments to get involved, allow us to bring on new interns, and hopefully get, let us get some funding. We hope to launch our updated program in the fall of 2009, assessing three departments every quarter, and then after a department goes through the assessment, we would then do a follow-up assessment a year later to ensure that the standards are being upheld. This concludes this AIA presentation. You know, we encourage you to get in touch with us. We are happy to share any of our resources or data. It's all public. We're not trying to hide anything. Uh, our website is not currently up right now. We hope to have it live within two weeks. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Very good. Uh, as I said before, what we're going to do is we're going to go right into the Berkeley presentation, and then we will open it up for questions and answers, and I think we're right on schedule. The three people that will be uh, presenting for UC Berkeley are Lisa Bauer. She's the manager of campus recycling and refuse services on the campus. She's been in this 
I want to say business or science or art for the last 20 years. She's been, uh, I think, at Berkeley 11 or 12 years in that role. And as many people in, in that field also uh, have moved on to sustainability, she's been involved with that in the last eight years. She's co-chaired the Chancellor's Advisory Committee on Sustainability, and she's co-taught uh, classes, courses on sustainability. Judy Chess uh, is the Assistant Director for Green Building Programs at UC Berkeley. She is involved with also the Green Initiative Fund, TGIF, and also has been on uh, the uh, Chancellor's Advisory Committee on Sustainability. Uh, she's uh, the Facility Services Liaison to the Building Sustainability at Cal program. She helped establish the Office of Sustainability at uh, UC Berkeley. She's uh, LEED certified and she has a Master's in Landscape Architecture and City Planning from UC Berkeley and a Bachelor's from the University of Manitoba. That's in Canada for those of you that like to know more about geography. There'll be a test later. Finally, we have our Irene Silverstone, Stove, excuse me, my apologies. Did I, am I in the ballpark? I'm close. My name is Pawazik. I'm always very sensitive to those things. Irene is a lead coordinator of building sustainability at Cal. She was the residential sustainability education coordinator her first year at UC Berkeley, and she later uh, uh, was a member of, of uh, the, she was the administrative intern on the Chancellor's Advisory Committee on Sustainability, and she helped plan the fifth annual Sustainability Summit. All right, ladies, you're on. This is a mandatory slide. Oh, right. And that is the wrong button. Okay. <clears throat> so, hello, my name is Irene, and that's Lisa, and that's Judy. Um, and unfortunately, Sarah couldn't be here today. Um, so, Building Sustainability at Cal is uh, a student run and organized group which collaborates closely with departments and campus. Um, groups as well as student groups and um, you'll see a lot of overlap between our program and PACES but I'll try to highlight both uh, the similarities and the differences um, and the mission of Building Sustainability at Cal is to reduce building and campus environmental impacts through education and infrastructural changes <clears throat> and so uh, just to give you the current structure of Building Sustainability at Cal, uh, currently it's run by seven coordinators, one of whom is sitting in the audience right now. Shout out to Claire. Um, we teach, we co-facilitate two service learning classes for a total of about 30 students. We have six year-long building interns, um, three undergraduate apprenticeship students, and um, so overall, these students work in about 20 buildings on both building-specific projects and also campus-wide projects. Um, and with that, I'm actually going to hand off to Lisa, who is going to talk about the history of this program. And I don't need a microphone. <laughs> okay, I'll hold it far away then. Um, so I want to talk just a little bit about uh, how this all started. Um, it started with a building named uh, Stanley Hall. It was both the old building that got knocked down, and then they rebuilt a building, and it was called Stanley Hall again. And uh, a student who's also sitting, no longer a student, and sitting in the audience, Laura Moreno, who now works for the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, so really what this was about was there was a new building coming online. It had not fallen into the green building requirement for the UC system, which chagrined many of us because it was a huge building and we knew it would be an immense energy hog. Um, and so I did a little background work. I went and visited the building coordinator early before the building was actually, the minute he was named, I kind of went, hi, um, would you like to be a green building? And he said, 
a lot of concept. Um, and what we really did was um, tried to target them because they were a very high visibility building. It was going to be a really large interdepartmental uh, kind of effort, and it would have pulled on a lot of large players. This started back when sustainability had become more than um, uh, we, pew, we few, we precious few, but not quite the household name that we know it to be now on campus. Um, so we got the building manager and the program director interested, and um, the only problem was the money. So for the first three months, my unit um, spotted the cost of the program. So I uh, sold them the concept of Laura as this wonderful, educated, um, hit secret weapon, student, uh, educated, student education coordinator, and uh, paid for her for the first three months. Um, and then, there, here's Laura in the middle, or I'm sorry, in the, on, the, on this side. Oh, do I have to do both of these? I do. Okay, here, you click. Thank you. So uh, what we did really as a model is we took the, um, the RSEC program, that stands for the Residential Student Education Coordinator Program. It was a, a program that was developed for the residence halls, figuring we'd get the students early and often, get them kind of tracked towards sustainability the first year, freshmen, uh, because we didn't usually get a chance to hit them after that. Um, and uh, we modified it to be, instead of, uh, Peer students uh, working with other students in the building, they, in their dorm, they were working with staff and faculty and perhaps other students in the, uh, in the, the Stanley Hall of the building. So it was really well received. People in a building would much rather listen to a student than a stodgy, stodgy old middle-aged lady. Um, so it, Laura was very effective. Um, and she also got away with a lot of stuff that most staff and faculty can't get away with because she's a student. She's the customer on campus, right? So um, she uh, was actually so well received, she was actually hired for multiple years. How many years did you work there? Two? Okay, so she was there for two years. Um, and she worked very, very closely with uh, the staff there and with the building management, trying to integrate green, sustainable aspects into the building. Um, next. So then we kind of thought, okay, this is a great idea, we need more people. So what do we do? Uh, there, were, there had been a uh, service learning class, ES84, that kind of had a changing uh, subject basis based on what the need was, was that year. Um, we'd done a climate uh, class several years before with Fomita Ahmed also in the audience, and we'd done multiple different studies. So we thought, okay, well, it makes a lot of sense. And Laura uh, approached the professor and talked with him about the concept of having the class have as its classwork doing some of the education outreach and surveys and uh, work that Laura had done in Stanley Hall, and that's exactly what happened. So uh, we chose building coordinators and managers that we knew were sympathetic to the uh, concept and were going to be willing to spend a little more time than necessary than they otherwise would have, supporting what we were doing, listening, helping, getting us into the rooms that we needed to get into. Um, and simultaneously, we were starting to look at the LEAD EB framework and realize that this was an opportunity to take these students, start crafting the surveys, crafting the coursework, crafting what they were doing in the buildings to meet some of the requirements for doing LEAD EB certification. So it kind of was like the perfect storm. Um, so quickly, I'll say students are the secret weapon. There is no question about it. They're smart. They're interested. They don't cost a lot. They are worth a lot more than they get paid. They're informed and then they're passionate. Um, the real challenge though with students, you've probably heard this before, you have to do a succession planning. You have to find the next set of students. So I have to say, we had Laura and then Irene. Now we have Irene and then Claire and then we're gonna have Claire and then question mark. And it's vitally important that you make sure the student who is running the program starts looking for their replacement before they even start running the program. <laughs> And um, really also, uh, it's important, the students are there to learn. And you really do need to add to their educational experience, not just use them for their brilliance. Um, it's good not to export the educational acumen that we have on campus, but you need to provide value for them. My, um, my biggest uh, learning experience, feed them. <laughs> students love to be fed. They'll work really well if you feed them. So um, with that, I will hand it to Judy Chess. 
Thank you. Um, okay, um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what we've called institutionalizing sustainability. I'm, um, as, um, as was in my introduction, I'm the facility services liaison for the building sustainability at Cal program. And part of what um, Lisa uh, started off describing, I want to continue to say, how do you manage um, and how do you institutionalize such a, a program that is active in so many different buildings? And, and as the uh, presentation goes on a little bit, um, Irene's going to describe sort of the breadth of the work that we do. Um, one of the things that um, the, the program works very closely with people from the facilities office. Um, even before uh, we had a financial relationship with the program, um, they were very collegial in working with uh, building coordinators, but also working with staff at facilities, staff in um, the Office of Sustainability and uh, various aspects of capital projects to find out what are the th things that the class can do that will help promote the university's sustainability goals in various, uh, in various buildings. And then just overall, are there certain things that we want the class to help us study or help us uh, and help them learn? One of the things that was extremely um, effective was a few years ago, kind of as a precursor to this class, we had students do similar to the UCSB work. We had them do energy audits in buildings doing things like finding some old refrigerators, um, finding out really what kind of some of the plug loads were. And it was really interesting, I think Lisa talked about this, how much information students could, um, could gather for the facility staff. It really, it really sort of fills a hole in the program, um, you know, when you have such a broad uh, range of, of people and services and um, so many buildings and, and functions on campus, it's really hard to find out some of those things, like where are all the old refrigerators? And when you add up those things and you combine them over the size of a, uh, a neighborhood or a small city, the size of the Berkeley campus, these small changes really do make a big difference. Um, so in the fall of uh, 2006, Lisa described the funding coming from um, sort of her uh, her re refuse and uh, recycling and refuse management program, starting off with uh, one intern in a building, um, then that building itself, uh, that department funded the intern, and then there was some uh, support received from the Chancellor's Advisory uh, Committee on Sustainability through the Green Fund process. And then last year, the group applied for and was successful um, in receiving our funding from the Green Initiative uh, Fund, and that was a fairly substantial grant of, I think, $25,000 that really enabled the program to not only have the two service learning classrooms, uh, classes, but then to have these paid positions that extend for the length of a school year. And it put the program in the position, um, and sustainability as a mission, in the position of being able to go to a department and saying, we have the service to offer you, will you let us come and work in your building? And I think it was a real um, kind of a shift in, in terms of being able to have um, a resource to go out and, and offer the campus community. Um, We'll talk a little bit um, more about some of the specific projects, but some, in, in some cases, the projects and the work that the students did were so value added in terms of finding um, resources such as some energy savings and some water savings that the Vice Chancellor for Facilities has agreed to um, continue to fund the program as part of his operational budget moving forward. Now, um, we, of course, we don't know exactly how that's all going to shake out, given that we are having a challenging budget year. But again, there's such high value for such relatively, um, the, the students really do so much good, valuable work on the resource conservation front for such a modest amount of money that I'm confident that the program is going to remain as robust as it was in the past. Um, one of the things that we have done is that most of the campuses, um, actually everybody at this conference probably has some element of a strategic energy plan underway, and we've worked to match up some of the BSAT classes uh, with the strategic energy, plan, plan, uh, strategic energy program projects in that we, um, there's a process by which um, our students are trained by our energy engineers, Raul, who's also in the audience here, to perform the energy audits in a way that actually will support the definition of a project under the um, strategic energy plan. We've had students in the past um, take the program and then become so inspired that then they've uh, continued with helping us develop a refrigerator replacement program. Um, and then also 
we're now working to match them up with the Lead for Existing Buildings program as we go forward with our uh, um, building commissioning, our retro commissioning projects through the Strategic Energy Plan. Uh, some of the other partnerships that have emerged are um, for us on the green building and facilities end, it's really useful to have um, a fairly large uh, group of organized, uh, knowledgeable, and interested students that we can go to when we have an initiative come up. We recently have uh, sold our warehouse building um, in Berkeley, and we're going to be relocating a lot of the contents of that building and then uh, actually disposing of a lot of uh, surplus material. And we've been able to go and work with the ex existing student programs to sort of help with that project in terms of helping departments figure out how to divert their waste and not have it all end up in the landfill. Um, we've had the BSAC students work directly with the plumbing shop on a program to replace the aerators uh, in selected high volume restrooms on campus. Um, the students were able to get the aerators at no cost from our local uh, municipal water provider, at something that we in facilities had not been able to do for two years. And I'm not sure how they did it, I still kind of don't exactly want to know, but I was very pleased when um, I think Claire and Irene brought a box of aerators to the plumbers, to the meeting, and said, here, and the plumbers went, oh, thank you, that's great, we'll go install them. Um, I've never really seen anything happen quite so quickly on campus. Um, and then what's underway right now is really um, a, a pretty extensive process by which the class and the student interns are working with our facilities people who are in charge of our lead uh, existing billions volume certification uh, process to identify where are the areas of overlap where the students can work on projects that will help document and achieve um, our volume credit. So um, I think, is this, am I, do I keep going? Okay. Because um, the person in our office who does lead for existing buildings had a family emergency, so she's not here. So, so uh, one of the things is, as everybody knows, there's a performance period um, in lead for existing buildings. There's a protocol that you have to follow um, when you do these energy audits. Um, part of the overlap with that is learning, is having the classes learn how to do the audits in a way that meets the lead requirements, and then also we can't forget in this that it is actually also about the students learning not only, um, you know, we don't want to make, we want to make sure that it's not about the students just doing facilities, you know, the work that facilities can't get to. There really is this part of uh, learning about resource conservation and then also learning about how institutions work, things like in the Santa Barbara program, how to change behavior, how to work with people, the disconnect sometimes between uh, goals and, and actual behavior and so on. Um, we've got a couple projects underway right now for the working on the lead uh, volume certification and individual like uh, EBOM in University Hall and Worcester Hall. And um, some specific projects underway for um, documenting things like our green cleaning and our um, landscape management and so on. Um, Um, over the last year, these are just some examples of projects that the class has completed in the past, in the past year uh, relative to the University Hall and Worcester Hall projects. Is there oh, anything? Okay. All right, and now Irene's going to, uh, who's the program coordinator for the coming year, is going to describe the types of projects coming up for the, um, in this program year. So I will just, the, the idea here is that students can help with, um, with some lead projects um, and including, you know, the building, the building manager and the sustainability team had, in, for example, University Hall had already created this plan. They were going to pass out task lighting and we had interns working in the building so they asked our, our building interns to help out. So, um, it, it, students can play a more vital role, um, a larger role in creating plans, but they can also help uh, in a more auxiliary way um, in just assisting the people who are already working in the building to get stuff done. Um, and I really like this slide because um, it's amazing to, oh, um, next, next one up. Mm. Uh, <laughs> I really like this slide because it's amazing how much students can accomplish in, in one semester. Um, I, I don't want to mislead you. Uh, in, some, in some cases, 
um, an educational project needed an audit to be done. Um, so it was sort of uh, one project, but it had two components to it. But um, basically, as you can see, Billings St. Isaac Health really does focus uh, still at the moment on audits um, because audits are sort of easier for students to do um, than do than to do an infrastructural project. Which, first of all, it's difficult to accomplish uh, an infrastructural project in one semester. Um, there's a, an upfront cost that oftentimes our um, our program can't can provide. Um, so that's why you see the the numbers are really so um, so different. And education and outreach. Um, is yet another very strong point of the program. It's great to have students out there on the ground who can go out and talk to people and, and create these educational programs which aren't as costly as infrastructural, um, as infrastructural projects. And so now I would like to go through and um, talk a little bit about what each type of these, which, what each type of these projects entails. Um, just like PACES, we do waste audits. It's my, um, sort of my favorite type of audit because you really do get to go through trash. Um, and uh, we also do water and lighting audits. Uh, and all three of these audits uh, take, take into consideration the lead requirements. Um, therefore, if a building were to eventually want to apply for lead certification, they could use the data that the students collected in order to do so. Um, now, these two charts are really inspirational, actually. So the, the chart on top is, well, both of these charts pertain to a waste audit conducted in the promenade, actually Judy's building. And the chart on top, um, where you see the red, that said 23% mixed paper that we found in the, in the trash. So this was paper that was going to landfill. It wasn't being recycled by building occupants. It was being thrown away. Um, then this past semester, students in the promenade went in and they did an intensive, um, every Friday the students were in there, they held office hours and they basically were on um, the, on the staff's back saying, hey, you should recycle the paper um, and all sorts of other things that, the, that uh, people working in the building can do. And when we did a follow-up waste audit in this, uh, in this semester that just ended, we found 10% um, mixed paper in the, in the waste audit, in the waste stream, which is a, decre a, a, a really good decrease. Now, I mean, to be fair, it, it could be for various reasons, but this is a pretty good sign that education um, it plays a huge role in, in creating change on campus. Um, and also, uh, something that we've had the ability to do now is because we had this year long, we had an opportunity to work in the prominent for a year. So whereas in the fall semester, we were able to do this initial, you know, get a, get a baseline, figure out what the promenade was doing with their paper, then implement a program in the following semester, and then have a follow-up waste audit. Um, truly, that is why we do audits, is so that we have something to compare. Um, it's, a, it's a qualitative analysis of a, it's a quantitative analysis of a qualitative program, such as an education program. <clears throat> Next slide. Oh, okay. So. Structural and operational projects, as, as we said, they're a little bit harder to implement. Uh, this semester, I would say that the three largest projects that, that students were working on um, were these, as you see on, on uh, this slide. Paper towel composting pilot, uh, interns worked in eight, in eight restrooms in two buildings to try to figure out what a paper towel composting program would look like. So uh, as Lisa always says, you want to try small, figure out the mistakes there, and then go big. The idea here is we were going to figure out what type of signage works, what type, uh, where, should we put the, where should we put the bins. Um, we did a lot of education. We, we did a lot of outreach to custodial staff because they were the ones who were going to be picking up the paper towels. Um, and so this is an example of a structural, of a structural project. Uh, Judy mentioned the sink area replacement and lastly the 10 cent discount in the building cafe where we worked with the, with the cafe manager to um, have people who bring in their own mugs have a 10 cent discount. And so, lastly, education is something that is intertwined throughout the entire program and it's not a separate component. Um, we teach, we co-facilitate two classes, ES84 and ER199 with two professors who are kind enough to, um, to let us do that. Um, we, uh, some other examples, so the students in these two classes learn about sustainability topics on and off campus, then they go in and they do audits or work on campus-wide projects. Um, uh, other types of educational uh, projects that were worked on this semester were, just like PACES did, have lunch meetings with the building occupants, talk about the findings that we found, what we found in your trash. People are really surprised usually um, by those findings. Um, and almost all projects have education components to them, as we all know, that's one of the, that's the best way to, that's the best way to get good results. 
And um, this is the last slide, I promise. I think my time is short. Um, so challenges in looking ahead. Um, the program was able to, as you saw this progression, how the, the program started out small, just like Paces, it started as this pilot in this one building, and then it grew into something larger. Um, but, gr but growing at a sustainable rate is, is what we find to be one of the most uh, difficult challenges. It's not to overextend the program. We had a great foundation that was laid by Laura Moreno and uh, co-founder co Desiree Early, um, and so it's important to keep, keep, the, keep the mission and the goal, goal in mind before expanding. Um, that said, we're implementing a new aspect of the program um, where we will try to provide services um, such as audit, audits on a case-by-case -case basis. We will continue to facilitate the two classes. Having a website presence is very important. Without a website, you basically don't exist. Um, people are always asking us what our website is, and I'm, I say, I'm sorry, we don't have one. It's, it's coming up soon. Um, we can see that the program is beginning to take on a consulting role on campus. This is very different from what it, it began as. It, was, it began as a data gathering body, and now it's becoming more of a people send us emails asking, well, what can we do about this? And we now have the knowledge and the resources to, to answer those questions. Um, and staying innovative and pertinent, um, staying exciting and useful to campus is a huge goal. As students on campus, we don't want to be, become obsolete. So thank you very much. Uh, let me uh, repeat the question just to make sure that it's on tape. Um, I think the, the key point there was, or key question was, who really initiated these programs? Do they come from the students or do they come from the staff side? Uh, well, the PACES program at UCSB was really a student-led uh, initiative. Students really started this and we pushed uh, the, the various committees and the staff to get involved and to get their support behind it. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's really hard to differentiate where it started. I mean, it's a partnership between students and staff. I mean, it was a concept. There was an existing program. Uh, I tend to hearken to students more because they are, frankly, I'm cheap and lazy, and I want someone else to do work for me, and they're willing, and they come forward, and I'm like, yeah, here you go. So honestly, um, it, it's just I've been very fortunate. Um, I guess theoretically I s was my concept, but Laura really took it. Um, but it's, it starts with students coming forward. It's, if a student comes forward to you, take advantage of it. Get the email. Take them out to lunch. Put up a sign in the bathroom saying, I'm looking for, you'd be amazed who'll come forward for credit. Um, with us, we have our full-time sustainability coordinator. And having a sustainability coordinator at the campus really gives a focal point for students to go to, yeah. And really, with her coordinating job, it literally is her job to find interns. It's to provide students with that opportunity to do what they want with it. And she works with us to build the programs. Um, so just having that contact person really helps students find their voice. 